Let me introduce you the more, even more experienced uh, guests here on the panel. Uh, let's start with a lady on my left hand side. She has been a member of the German parliament since 2005. She's one of the most traveled members of the German parliament in Afghanistan and Pakistan. She was just made the defense spokesperson for the liberal party in the German parliament. As much as anyone, she's a passionate supporter of the troops. Please give a warm welcome to Elke Hoff. Yeah. On the right side, really far right side, <laughs> he's a 16-year veteran of the US Foreign Service. From 2003 to 2005, he was the lead action officer on Afghanistan issues at the US, US mission to NATO. 2006, he spent a year in Afghanistan in Kunduz and in Kabul at ISAF headquarters. Right now, he serves as the head of the political military unit at the US Embassy in Berlin. Please give a warm welcome to William Müller. Yeah. As the Minister of Interior, he created a trained force of 50,000 Afghan National Police to fight against crime, terrorism, and narcotics in Afghanistan. His efforts lead to the removal of warlord governors, corrupt officials, and inefficient pol police chiefs. Currently, currently, he's working as a distinguished professor at the Near East South Asia Center for Strategic Studies in Washington. And one thing you should know about him, he's fluent in English, Pashto, Dari, Farsi, Tajik, Russian, French, Arabic, Turkish, and Urdu. <laughs> Please say welcome to Ali Jalali. <laughs> well, since we are discussing accelerating success in Afghanistan, goals and challenges for international uh, cooperation, Mr. Jalali, um, what does the Afghan population expect from international community to achieve? Well, this summer, uh, the uh, public mood in Afghanistan is a combination of anxiety, in hope. The uh, level of uh, violence uh, and weakness of the government that cannot deliver services actually creates anxiety to people that what is going to happen to them. What drives people today in Afghanistan mostly is a, a survival mentality. And as you know, survival mentality or survival concerns go hand in hand with corruption. On the other hand, the uh, public mood is also uh, one of hope. Hope that maybe a new approach by, the, by NATO and realizing that in the past nine years, not enough effort was made to stabilize Afghanistan in the new US uh, uh, approach to the situation, a military and uh, civilian surge will probably create a better conditions that will be conducive to the establishment of peace, good governance, and the rule of law. That's what people want. If eventually, Afghans uh, want very simple thing. That is human security. Human security with two aspects. To freedom from fear and freedom from want. That's what they want. So Mr. Miller, what are the... How do I turn this on? Okay, um, this seems to be a little bit louder. <laughs> um, Mr. Miller, um, what are the challenges to achieve this goal? Well, I think, I think the main challenge we have is time. Uh, we've been in Afghanistan almost nine years. I think, as the ambassador outlined, we finally have the right strategy. Even more important than the right strategy is that all, the, all of our allies in Afghanistan now believe in the strategy. And as the ambassador outlined, that was not always the case. I've been in, in Berlin for uh, almost four years, and I spent the first couple years trying to defend things like OEF and uh, the, the US concept and what we were doing in the South versus the North. Uh, and fortunately, a lot of that stuff is over because we're, I think we're all in the same sheet of music. Uh, I think if you ask most um, German Bundeswehr members, I think they do believe sincerely in the McChrystal counterinsurgency strategy. Uh, we're, we're now looking at Afghanistan and Pakistan as a whole, as a single operational area. I think before we were 
Uh, you know, Germans were looking at the north, and we were focused on the east, and the Brits were in the south, and the Italians were in the west, and we all were looking at our little individual areas of Afghanistan. So we're all on the same sheet of music. We have the right commander. We have the right strategy. But the question is, do we have enough time? Because we have been there a long time already. The Afghans are getting tired. Um, they've had uh, forces come through their areas many, many times to clear the insurgents. But then what happens is that we're not there to hold. So the insurgents come back in. They take retribution. And uh, they wonder, is it really worth it to side on, uh, on, on, on our side, to come to our side, to support the government? If they can't really protect me, if they can't really keep the insurgents out, maybe it's better just to side with the folks that look like they're going to win, and that's the insurgents. So I think that's our biggest challenge, is, is time to really convince the people um, that we have a strategy that's going to work, that we're really going to stay enough time to enable the uh, Afghan government to provide uh, the most basic public service, which is security, but then all the other uh, public services as well, which I would say the second most important public service in Afghanistan is justice. People want justice. And I have to say, if you ask, um, if you, I think you've asked most, most Afghans, they would say uh, that one comparative advantage the Taliban have is they provide justice. It's quick. They make a decision. It's brutal. Uh, it's arbitrary. But there is justice. They do resolve conflicts. Um, they, they don't have the problem of the corruption that uh, the Afghan government does. So um, that, we, we basically have a time problem uh, to, to convince the, the Afghans that uh, we're, we're going we're gonna to successfully enable the Afghan government to, to provide uh, the basic services they need. So it might take some time uh, to g gain the trust of the Afghans. Um, do we have the time in Germany since German population doesn't really like the German troops being in Afghanistan? I think we must do everything to convince our public that it is necessary to stay in Afghanistan as long at, as it is necessary. But uh, hmm. I remember when my last discussion I had with uh, Stanley McChrystal in Kabul and we were talking about counterinsurgency strategy and uh, winning the hearts and the minds. But from my perspective, we have missed one uh, very important objective. It's not just to win the hearts and the minds of the Afghans, but also to win the hearts and the minds of the people at home. Because without the support of the citizens in the countries which are contributing troops, money, and, and other resources, human resources, it is very difficult to achieve a sustainability that even if we do not match the time limit we, we have set ourselves, so we, I think this is, could be one of another homemade problem we have, just to, to raise the impression that we can withdraw from Afghanistan in one and a half year. So I think we have to do more to convince and to inform our people at home. Therefore you need time, of course, therefore you need a common understanding. and. Um, Still, I disagree a little bit with what uh, Phil has mentioned before. This morning, I have taken part in a discussion on Afghanistan in the Canadian Embassy. And it was a quite different approach, because the culture of the different members of the coalition still lingers through the whole ISAF uh, mission we have. You know, see, some, some uh, countries, they have a more civ civilian approach. They say we uh, have to do more in building the uh, uh, civilian capacities, uh, 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 institution building. And you rightly mentioned, and I fully agree with you, that before we do not have the security on the ground, all the other things will be very, very difficult to achieve. So I think still, we have two main objectives, not just only to convince the Afghans, but also to convince our people at home. If we do not achieve this, I think we will really have a problem in the coming months. Yeah. I think that's part of the time pressure that Bill yes. refers to. Yeah. It's not just the amount of time and the patience of the Afghan population, it's our own populations. And this is very unpopular in Germany, but it's not terribly popular in the United States either. Okay. But did I get you right that we're not on the same page? Uh, yes, and then the ambassador, ambassador said uh, Yeah, I think that, okay, it's okay. <clears throat> I think that we are dealing with, with different cultures. We, we are dealing with different military cultures. We are dif uh, dealing with different political cultures and with different capacities. And I really admire 
uh, all the efforts that our American friends are doing in Afghanistan, it's, it's really unimaginable how many resources you are delivering to, to Afghanistan. Uh, we do not have these capacities, and we, we try to convince uh, our, our lawmakers and our taxpayers that we have to contribute, but you know we have the financial crisis and things will get more and more difficult. So therefore, it is, it is so important, first of all, to create some kind of success, and I hope that Maja will really become a, a uh, how to say, a, 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 an example, a good example for the success of counterinsurgency. Mr. Jalali, what did you hear about Marja? Uh, the ambassador uh, said that there is a great success, has been a great success in the last weeks. Uh, what did you hear from the Afghans there? Uh, well, uh, to be sure, the clear part of the operation was a su success. However, the hold and build part will be known whether it is success or not in the next few months. I think recently, uh, General Carter and uh, the South uh, Regional Command uh, said that they need about three more months to see how successful that operation was. And this is the, the uh, challenge in, a, in counterinsurgency operations. That uh, if you look at the, uh, the Afghan, I, this morning I said I uh, come. I have seen this conflict from different perspectives. I was insurgent and counterinsurgent, so I have seen it from both sides. And uh, the uh, people in Afghanistan supported Taliban in 1994, and they removed them in uh, 2001 for the same reason. In 1994, they thought they can bring a better government and end lawlessness and disarm warring factions. And then when they failed in 2001, I think it was the, 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 the majority of Afghan people who helped the, the overthrowing the Taliban with only 500 ground troops from the international community deployed in Afghanistan. So therefore, today again in Marja, people, when people realize that this operation created a space in which where a good governance was established, the rule of law was established, and rebuilding takes place. Then they will uh, come to the government side and will uh, renounce Taliban, because the majority of people in Afghanistan do not want Taliban to come back, but they are reluctant to stand up against them on behalf of a government that cannot protect them or cannot provide justice to them. But um, last week I got the impression that it's really, really difficult. Uh, I was told that they're trying to build there or sent there like something like a government in a box. They're trying to, to re-establish a new government down there in Maja. How successful is this, has this been so far? No government can, can be put in a box. I think the government is something that people would trust. And it will be known in the next, whether that government that will taken out of the box or the government that later on will be expanded in, 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 in Maja. Uh, that's important. Uh, I, I uh, you know, I've seen in many parts of Afghanistan during my uh, term as a Minister of Interior that people, uh, when they realize that uh, they get protection and services, they are very, very, very quickly change their sides. And I think legitimacy in Afghanistan, they have two major pillars. One is protection of population, that's security. Other one is justice or the rule of law. In order for any government to provide these two services, it has to control its territory. So that's where the, the space comes. The, uh, in Maja, the space is being created, but it will take time to, uh, for a government to provide the two other services, protection of population and the rule of law. But after 30 years of war, is it possible to um, win hearts and minds of the Afghan population? I will make a distinction between hearts and minds. You know, Afghans, uh, you know, are very pragmatic people. Today, go to Marja, go to Helmand. Their hearts with the, with the political process, the post-Taliban political process, their minds make uh, logical decisions, practical decisions. And the Taliban actually do not own their hearts, but they own to dominate their minds. So therefore, why in the, in, I'm not talking about 30 uh, years, in the 30, 30 years before Afghans were victims. Victim of the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan first, that destroyed everything in the country, including the, the rural uh, areas. 1.6 million Afghans are, are uh, lost their lives. The infrastructure was destroyed, government institutions were destroyed. So the, the, uh, therefore, I'm not talking about 30 years. 
in the nine years, the past nine years, in the, the reason the country did not stabilize is not because it was not feasible, because we didn't try enough. It was the, 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 the uh, least resource uh, reconstruction project uh, after World War II. In, at the same time, Afghanistan was 30 years uh, suffered from uh, violence and, 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 and war. Afghanistan was a poor country in the beginning to, to start with, anyway. In Afghanistan, actually, uh, after the uh, withdrawal of the Soviet Union, was a broken state. And it expected other countries in the neighborhood, other countries in the Islamic world, to come and help that broken country that actually uh, get sacrificed to, 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 to uh, force a, a major superpower who invaded the country. However, these countries came, instead of helping that country, they actually exploited that broken nation. And I to borrow a line from our friend, uh, Professor Fukuyama, the poor nation lost during history and at the end of history. Well, I know we have a well-informed audience here today, but maybe some of them don't know the term coin and um, the, abbrevi the, the abbreviation of counterinsurgency. So, and there might be a lot of mi misunderstanding on that term. Could you try to explain briefly what it is with some examples? Um, actually, if I was giving this talk three years ago, I would have said, I would have made the argument to you that we're doing counterinsurgency. And of course, we understand that we can't uh, uh, prevail in Afghanistan with military means alone. So you may be asking, well, what have you changed? Why is it, why is it different now? Why are you telling us now it's going to be better? And I would say that while we're doing, we've been saying that we've been doing counterinsurgency since the very beginning, there's been two major differences. One is exactly what um, Minister Jalili just said, it's resources. We did not resource the Afghanistan mission uh, to the, the extent we needed to. There was a couple of reasons for that. One was a deliberate, it was a deliberate decision. Uh, a lot of people argued that if we sent too many troops, too many foreigners to Afghanistan, it would look like we're occupying the country. So it was a very deliberate policy of a light footprint. Uh, the second reason, uh, to be very honest, it was Iraq. And I will always remember Admiral Mullen, who was our, uh, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, when he was testifying before Congress. Um, he said, uh, we, we do everything we, uh, we have to. We commit all the resources we need to, uh, to Iraq. But Afghanistan, we make do with what we have. And that, unfortunately, really was the situation uh, up until 18 months ago, uh, when uh, President Obama came in, did a comprehensive review of the strategy and said, uh, we need to have a, a, a change in course here because things are going in the wrong direction. Uh, and that's when he made the decision, the initial decision last uh, March, more than a year ago, to send additional troops. Uh, and then he, he uh, uh, made a decision in December to, sell, to send still more troops. Uh, and not only send more troops, but send more civilians. I mean, we have tripled the number of civilians in Afghanistan. We have over 1,000 civilians. Uh, because before, uh, we didn't have the specialists out in the field who were helping to do the build. So even if you did the clear, even if you could do the hold, you didn't have the specialists out there uh, to do the build. So that is really uh, the, the, the big difference. I think another uh, difference from before, uh, besides the resourcing, is the fact that we have a commander who really understands counterinsurgency and who's done it before. Until uh, General McChrystal, we had conventional commanders. I mean, who we had people command, I mean, they're, if you're a four-star general, you're a smart guy. Uh, you can, uh, but uh, they had different experiences. There were armor officers. You know, their experience was from the Cold War. There were infantry or, or whatever. General McChrystal is a special forces officer. He has spent his whole career doing special operations. He understands very clearly what counterinsurgency is. And even more important, he does an excellent job of explaining it. Because if you're a four-star general, you're not actually doing, uh, you, you're at a pretty high level. But he does an excellent job of imparting to everybody exactly what this means. Um, and it, May it's, I interrupt you? Yeah. So if it's not about conventional warfare anymore, what do we need all these additional troops for? Well, the, the, the name of the game, in, in conventional warfare, the name of the game is seize territory and kill the enemy. And, uh, I mean, Europe, of course, is, has a lot of experience in conventional warfare. Uh, there's not a lot of uh, care given to 
uh, civilians that might be in the way. The idea is to go after the enemy at any cost. Um, and, but that is not, obviously, uh, the way to achieve success against an insurgency. The whole focus is different. As the ambassador said, the, the focus is on the population. The idea of your military forces is to protect the population. Uh, and what we were doing before is we were, we were saying the words, but as I said, the, uh, the commanders didn't have the experience uh, to really implement it properly. And I think with General McChrystal, we, we do have the right commander who can really get at the heart of it. Now, it's, it's taken a long time uh, to get this right. I and mean, he's been in command uh, since last summer. Um, it takes a while to get it implemented. And I would say the same thing in, in Marja. Uh, this is the first operation where we really uh, are, are, in a large scale, implementing counterinsurgency under General McChrystal. And uh, we're probably going to still make mistakes, because this is new for a lot of the soldiers that are operating under, under ISAF. But um, it, it is different from what we were doing before. Um, Ekhoff, the ambassador said General McChrystal wants the troops get out of armored vehicles and out of the secure installations. Um, but the German Minister of Defense said in January, January that German soldiers are not going to share sheets and blankets with Afghan troops. So that doesn't sound like that there is the same understanding of COIN. <coughs> Yes, that's right, and I think that General McChrystal is very much aware of uh, uh, the possibility of different approaches from the members of ISAF. And, and he knows very well that, for example, Germany does not have the capacities because our deployment of troops is just four months. And in four months, you cannot uh, uh, proceed a, an embedded partnering. So you have to find some kind of variation of this. But the, I think the, the main objective is to train the uh, Afghan security forces and to stabilize and to secure the regions you are responsible for. And, and we have to find out which are the appropriate means we can provide. We also have a lack of uh, equipment, as you well know. We, we don't have enough helicopters in the theater, and therefore we are very thankful that the Americans are now providing uh, the necessary equipment. But uh, anyway, as far as I have talked to, to, to Stanley McChrystal, he is very much aware of it, and we have to try to do our best to fit into this framework of counterinsurgency. But we have to be very clear, counterinsurgency does not mean only military means. It's just 30, in maximum 40% of a whole counterinsurgency mission, and this is nothing new. Counterinsurgency is somehow a traditional mean of security policy, and I, I very well remember the writing of, of John Galula, who is one of the fathers of, of counterinsurgency theory, and he rightly mentioned, and this is something which from my point of view is, is very much necessary in the counterinsurgency in Afghanistan, that one is responsible, and that all the components have to be there at the right time. And he says, if one of the com components is near, the whole result and the outcome will be zero. So we still have a lot to do. And the third part is that counterinsurgency needs time. And this is the key point, I think. Uh, and I hope that we are not falling into a trap we have created on our own because of the pressure at home. So I would be uh, quite reluctant to, to give the impression that counterinsurgency uh, is, uh, so to say, the magic tool now to solve all the problems. What we also need on the other hand, and I'm very much convinced of this, is a permanent political process in the region, which includes all the parties there, all the neighboring countries, something like um, I try to promote this idea, and I take the opportunity to do it here as well. What, what we need, I think, is a process which we had here in, 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 in Europe too, the OSCE process. Yeah. We need a permanent, institutionalized process, political process of finding a political solution, because after any military mission, there has to be a political solution. And for me, time has actually come to start to think about what happens after the armed conflict. And uh, for me, still, there is a lack of diplomatic efforts. There is still a lack of a coherent political concept, which includes Pakistan, India, Iran, Central Asia, Russia, and China. And th we, we know this very well. But for me, still, there is a, a kind of strategy 
which is missing, which is a political one and not just a military one. And I, I hope that finally it is not Stanley McChrystal who will be blamed for something which probably does not go in the right way we all have expected because I know that he is trying to do his best. But without the political support of all the members, I think even General McChrystal cannot, uh, he, he's not a magician. He is a very brave and a very clever soldier and uh, hopefully he will not be blamed in, in, in the end for this. Well, he seems to be magic somehow. He, he seems to be magic somehow. Um, there will be a peace dirga in Kabul in the upcoming days, which is somehow negotiating uh, and, uh, and a political process. Um, how do the Afghans feel about nego negotiating with the Taliban? Well, eventually all conflicts should end with some kind of a settlement or negotiations. However, in order to be able to conduct effective negotiation that can lead to peace, you have to create that, that favorable environment. In then Afghanistan, there are two issues under discussion reintegration of uh, low-ranking Taliban, and then reconciliation with the leadership. I think Afghanistan missed uh, two opportunities for a grand deal with the, with the opposition. One was a bomb. At that time, at the, during the bomb conference, 85 to 90 percent of Taliban was willing to join the process. However, they were excluded because at that time, that was the mentality after the quick and cheap victory in Afghanistan, Everybody was convinced where well, Taliban are gone, uh, and uh, they are uh, excluded, hated uh, group, and they are not going to come back. And uh, Taliban uh, would equal to Al Qaeda. So that was the mentality in the international community. At the same time, the Afghans too, the winning side, the Northern Alliance, were fighting the Taliban, uh, but unwilling to include them in the in the bond process. Bond process was not a peace conference. It was an emergency. Uh, meeting to uh, fill the gap, the vacuum that was created by the sudden collapse of the Taliban. So therefore, that was one uh, opportunity that was missed. The other opportunity was 2002-2003, after the Taliban uh, major meeting in Karachi, with, where they decided whether to follow or co continue a guerrilla war, or uh, stop negotiation with the, with, the, with the Kabul government. They contacted, the leaders contacted us in Kabul, contacted ministers, contacted President Karzai, and uh, they wanted just protection. And they said, if you want to continue our uh, uh, policy, we will do it uh, peacefully. At that time, we were, however, they wanted all stakeholders, all actors, Afghans and international community, to come up with a mechanism that can guarantee protection and it was failed. Today, it is very difficult to have, a, with, without cooperation from regional countries, from Pakistan particularly. Uh, however, but the local reconciliation and integration is possible only when the government succeeds in creating a space for good governance and the rule of law. Then the people who are on the fence, they, they, and they are fighting for different reasons, not, not uh, for ideology, they are susceptible to come back. The Jirga in Kabul is uh, not a negotiating uh, conference. It is to uh, try to bring together Afghans with a consensus for a framework. And once that framework is established, then there will be an initiative for uh, reaching out to the insurgents. Mr. Mayor, how could a framework look like? Well, um, I, I think to, to, to create the political framework, you do have to have the right conditions on the ground, as uh, Minister Jalili said. I, I, to be honest with you, I think we don't see a lot of, as the ambassador said, at the end, it's not going to be some great decisive battle that ends this uh, insurgency. It's going to be a political settlement. But to be honest with you, I don't think the Taliban yet have an incentive to negotiate. Why would they negotiate? Uh, it's all been going their way lately until, uh, in, until uh, very recently. Um, I still think a lot of them think they can win uh, with their current strategy. So why would they sit down at the table if they think they can, they, they can succeed and drive, drive the, uh, the international community out of Afghanistan and they can, and they can uh, basically control the country uh, without compromise, why would they sit down and negotiate? So I, 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 I take uh, Mrs. Hoff's point, but I, I do think um, we're probably not there yet. 
Uh, we're going to probably have to uh, carry out this counterinsurgency strategy for a while. We're going to have to, uh, we, we have to show the Taliban the insurgents. Um, hey, uh, the international community is actually being successful in uh, supporting the government and bringing the population over to support the government. And if we're not careful, we're going to be cut out of, the, out of, the, uh, out of this uh, ultimate uh, result. So I think that's where we, uh, we have to go to. Now, once we get to that point, um, in, in terms of the, the political settlement, I'm not, much of a, I'm not an, enough of an Afghan e expert to know how that's, that's going to, to work. What kind of coalition? How would you negotiate it? Um, I do know that a lot of people, when they hear the word political settlement, they fear that there'll be a sellout, that people, uh, the international community, in such a hurry to leave Afghanistan, that somehow a lot of the values uh, that, we've, uh, that we share will be sacrificed, for example, women's rights. And I mean, that's something that I think Secretary Clinton has stated very categorically. And I think this is shared by the, by the Afghan government. It's in the Afghan constitution. The protection of, of human rights is a part of the Afghan constitution. But how but, could you stop that process once the Taliban are in the, the government? How could you stop them from sacrificing women's rights, for example? Well, it, to, at the end of the day, what is in the Afghan constitution depends on what the Afghans want. Um, and the, the, other, the other big premise of all of this whole conversation we've had is that the insurgents are actually uh, are, are supported by only a very small percent of the population. If we actually thought the Taliban were supported by a majority of the population, counterinsurgency would never work because uh, the population supports the bad guys or what we think the bad guys are. But all the survey da data shows that, in fact, the Taliban are, support, are supported by a very, very small, I mean, single digits uh, in terms of the population. The reason they've been siding with the Taliban is because they think the Taliban's going to win. Um, so once again, the whole counterinsurgency strategy is about trying to convince the population that the Afghan government uh, is viable, can protect them, and that they can afford to not uh, side with the insurgents because the Afghan government's going to prevail in the end. Um, and so, but that is, but we haven't reached that point yet. That's, I mean, that's the, that's the biggest problem. Elkov, how do you think about negotiations with the Taliban? I think they are absolutely necessary because <coughs> to solve or to end the conflict, you have to deal with the conflict parties. You cannot exclude anyone because if, <coughs> if you try to exclude anyone, you will always have a problem and the problem will go on. And I think that um, to negotiate with the insurgency, you need the support of the neighboring countries because they have a strong influence and they have a strong support. They have support by financial means, by uh, equipment and other things. So therefore, uh, just to, to think that you can solve the problem militarily, I think this would be too short. You have, a whole, you have to, to, to <coughs> provide a whole variety of different measures. And um, even for the operation in Kandahar, you cannot do it without the support of the Pakistani army. On the other side, in Baluchistan, it's a very porous, it's an open border. So uh, I have visited the 12th Corps in Quetta, and it, it was a very, very interesting visit. And uh, I tried to, to imagine how it could be possible to, to stop the insurgency from uh, uh, fleeing over the, over the so-called border. It's, it's, it's not a border in, in the sense we know it. And it, th this means that everything depends on everything in, in the region. And from, from my point of view, uh, just to focus on, on the Afghan problems is, is uh, uh, too short-sighted for a political solution in the end. And we have made our experience now for nine years. And um, there were many strategies. We, we thought that they would be successful. As far as I remember, since I have been a member of parliament in 2005, we had at least three times a, a, a shift in strategy. First of all, we had the uh, uh, war on terror. Secondly, it was nation building. We have to build nation, women's rights, and democracy, and so on. And now, there's another shift in strategy. We say, OK, well, there must be a situation in Afghanistan that they can deal with the insurgency. We have to, to, to disrupt, dismantle, and defeat the insurgency. And then the Afghans, they should take care of it. So we have to, to how to say, to, to uh, uh, embed the, the, the insurgency so that the Afghans can deal with it themselves. And I think that uh, President Obama has clearly figured out in his speech in December 
that it's not the, the, uh, the main objective to build a nation in Afghanistan because he wants to build his own nation. So there is, a, a from my point of view, a substantial change. And we so do not care about women's rights in Afghanistan anymore? I think that <coughs> we should not uh, do the third step before the first step. And uh, also we in Germany, and also we in Europe, it took a long time since we arrived and achieved the goal of participation of women in political processes. I, re I remember very well that my grandmother and my mother, they had <laughs> huge difficulties. For, for us it is normal. But even for our, our parents, it has been very difficult uh, to, to fight for, for the women's rights. So it's still difficult. I think it's still difficult, but I think this is not the problem in Afghanistan. The problem in Afghanistan is to provide people security and justice. And um, I, I want to come back to the point that Mr. Jalali mentioned before. I remember well the words of a Canadian Brigadier General who said, what, what I have learned in two years of deployment, that Afghanistan is not a culture of corruption, but a culture of survival. And these are the basic needs of the people, that they have the ability to survive. And it's a daily struggle to survive. And I think that, sorry to say this as a woman, I, I want to be a little bit provo provocative, but finally, women's rights does not feed your children. And I saw children in Helmand Hospital who, who died just bes beside me when I was going through the hospital. And I, I frankly say I'm a mother as well. This was so heartbreaking. And I think this is what the Afghan people first of all need. And then we can talk about the other steps. So, <clears throat> well, we have to find a, a smart mixture of, of, of uh, political tools and military tools. And uh, I, I, uh, hopefully that we will find this point very soon. Political, the ambassador has a question. question? Um, I realize every time I spoke and I didn't use the microphone, Mark, you were jumping up, so I feel badly about that. Uh, Mr. Jalali, you mentioned the phrase uh, reintegration. So putting reconciliation aside for a moment, there's a theory. I'd love your perspective on this. The theory is that there are many, particularly young males, on the quote-unquote battlefield, not because they have a deep passion or conviction, but because it's the best alternative available, and that they, are, they should be, in theory, uh, more easily and per, more peacefully dealt with in terms of giving them other alternatives, whether it's financial, jobs, other avenues, to basically deplete the enemy in a peaceful process that we call reintegration. Would you mind uh, giving us your sense as to what you think the likelihood of success of that whole notion is? Bill. Well, any negotiation can succeed when the both sides, the two sides who are involved, have the incentives to realize that uh, they can get something through negotiation that they cannot get through violence. In Afghanistan, we are talking about Taliban and so on and so forth. Afghanistan does not face only insurgency or insurgencies. It is faces an unstable environment that, that is exploited by all groups. In, uh, ideologically um, motivated insurgents, uh, which are the only minority, then um, the tribal uh, leaders who are aggrieved, uh, resent uh, the, uh, the people who resent the, the, how they were treated by government officials or uh, other forces. I, I can I give you many, uh, uh, and then unemployed youth, about 40% of um, unemployment rate is there in, in, in rural areas. Drug traffickers, criminal networks, foreign oil. So they are all using an unstable environment. The majority of people do not want the Taliban to come back, but they are fighting for different reasons, for survival. Therefore, it is possible for these people to reconcile. However, you have to first convince them that joining the government in reconciliation can provide protection for them. If they were reluctant to, to, to join the government in the reconciliation process, if they say that uh, by, by doing so, they, they, they will be not uh, secure, not be protected. So the first, I think, the, the prerequisite for uh, these people to join the government is to create that space for them. And uh, you don't need to convince them to, to uh, <coughs> renounce violence. And uh, actually, the, you know, uh, 
not cooperate with Taliban. You don't have to convince them mentally. You have to provide the, the, the conditions for them that they will believe that by doing so, they will not be uh, you know, harmed by the Taliban to come. So this is possible locally. But reconciliation with the leadership from a position of weakness is not possible. Nor even if you reach a, a, a settlement, that will it be a recipe for more violence in the country. That, that could. Therefore, I think while local reconciliation, reintegration is possible through stabilization of operations, the grand deal with the, with, the, with the leadership of Taliban is not possible until their strategy is defeated or the government is in a position that to convince them that they cannot win militarily. Thank you, Mr. Murphy and the, uh, Mr. Mueller, uh, repeating us uh, very pertinently, of course, that in the past the international forces made mistakes and they, we learned from the mistakes and this time, um, uh, meaning that this time we will not make, commit the same mistakes again. Are we, uh, perhaps this question will be asked uh, to Mrs. Hoff, are we in a position to say that this time things are different from the past and we will really not repeat the mistakes that we have, in, we have done in the past? Of course it is difficult because uh, if we knew that it was a mistake, uh, we wouldn't have done uh, like we have done in the past. But is there anything different where we stand at present which make us believe that uh, things are could move uh, differently in the, in the future. Thank you very much. <coughs> Maybe one or two more. Let's do a, a lady on the left. Good afternoon. Fudini Kalanzi from the Hellenic Center of European Studies supporting the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Greece. You talked about so the main challenge that is, uh, uh, that is time. So I would like to ask what do you consider as a timeline, the uh, end point of this project, <coughs> this war project over there, and democratization, and what would uh, define the success of it? And a second question in an attempt to frame actually the, the project in Afghanistan with the cultural diplomacy uh, conference. I would like to ask um, what, uh, what um, are the goals for education um, since it's a part of democratization in the area. And how do you educate really people from a Western uh, world going over there? What, uh, how is it possible to educate people that are coming from a completely different cultural uh, background? Thank you. Okay, maybe a third question, this time from the back. I'm not trying to be as many to the left here. Cesar Ozan, PhD student at the University of Bielefeld. Um, Afghanistan is known as the graveyard of empires uh, from Alexander the Great to the Soviet Union and now the United States and NATO forces. <coughs> no foreign power has ever controlled uh, Afghanistan at this point. Uh, what makes Afghanistan different uh, from other countries? Why is it really uh, difficult to control this region? Maybe we start with the last one. Uh, so why is it a graveyard in Afghanistan? That is a myth. And uh, this is actually part of my lecture tomorrow, myths, realities, and uh, challenges in Afghanistan. You know, I uh, criticized two books recently. Both, what, one was published by a good friend of mine last year, uh, Sid Jones, Afghanistan, the Graveyard for Empire. The other one is just being published by another friend of mine, David Isby, who also is Afghanistan, the grave of empires. But Afghanistan is not grave of empires. Afghanistan is the hub of empires. Actually, if you look back in history, we are talking about Alexander the Great. We, we, yes, he faced uh, resistance because there was no central uh, power. He defeated the, the Persian Empire in two major battles. But in Afghanistan, he had to fight for every city. But eventually what happened, they created the greatest uh, Greek-Bacterian uh, Greek empire in Afghanistan, which lasted for 300 years. That stretched from Central Asia all the way to Northern India. 
in one of the kings of that Greek uh, bacterians, Demetrius, invaded all India. It created a kind of, and that was later on, uh, there was mixed with Buddhism, which created this uh, famous art of Greek Buddhic. Then uh, look at Turks. Turks came to Afghanistan, actually became Persianized, adopted the culture of the country, and became the major emperors of Afghanistan, Ghaznavids. Ghaznavid from Ghazni, the seat of Ghazni, they, uh, they ruled from eastern Iran all the way to northern India. And uh, I'm uh, happy to see that UNESCO is trying to, uh, or, or plan to celebrate Ghazni in 2013 as the center of Islamic civilization. Later on, look at Babur. Babur came and established, uh, 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 from Farghana, came and established a kingdom in Kabul. From Kabul, invaded India and created the major gunpowder empire, Mughal Empire. And his seat was Kabul. And he actually was loving with that Kabul. That's why he is buried in Kabul today. And uh, then, uh, of course, you go and, and, and you can find so many, many. On the other hand, Sometimes those who are talking about the, the grave of empire, they compare Soviet invasion of Afghanistan with today's international invasion. There are two different things. The Soviet invasion took place and actually aimed at propping up an unpopular regime that people are fighting against. The international community came and removed an unpopular regime that people are fighting against. During the Soviet occupation, six million of Afghans left the country and became refugees. During the in intervention of the Taliban's removal, actually 4.5 million refugees returned to the country. During the Soviet occupation, 1.6 million Afghans lost their lives because the rural area was totally destroyed. Today, with all the difficulties, you can see some kind of uh, uh, you know, reconstruction <coughs> effort in the rural areas. And, and uh, let's, let's be clear, Afghans are very pragmatic people. I think Arnold Time B was right to say it's a roundabout of history. Those who came and tried to help that country, they stayed, they became rulers of the country. Those who came and tried to uh, you know, uh, conduct other projects, they got defeated. So therefore, you have to put everything in, in, in perspective here. In Afghanistan today, you have progress, you have setbacks, but the problem is that the, the balance sheet is very complicated. Sometimes you have uh, achievements, but these achievements are undermined by setbacks you don't see it. Take the Kabul Kandahar Highway, a major highway, which was built in 2003. Cut the, the, the travel time from 27 hours to five hours. I have driven along this way. But today, because of the deterrence security situation, not many people are reluctant to use that highway. That's what the highway is there, you don't see it but you see the, the, the security deterioration. I saw Bill Miller taking notes on the second question. You might to answer the second question. Uh, on, the, on the timeline issue, um, well, as the ambassador described, our, our timeline, uh, at least in terms of the combat deployment, is to aim to begin our drawdown in July of, of next year. Um, but as the ambassador also emphasized, it is conditions-based. In other words, we're going to start our, our drawdown, but the speed at which we do that drawdown will depend on conditions in the ground. It is not a unilateral, in July 2011, we're pulling all the troops out. The, the second thing I would, I would highlight is there's a difference between combat troops and troops that, um, that you use for training the Afghan forces. I think there is a, a, an interest uh, on, on behalf of all the ISAF countries to end the combat mission as soon as possible, which is why we're really trying to accelerate the stand-up of the Afghan National Security Forces so that they can uh, provide for their own security. But I don't think anybody is under any illusions that somehow uh, we're going to stand up the Afghan National Army and then the US uh, and the rest of the international community can pull out. We are going to be in Afghanistan for very, well, uh, very many year, years. If for no other reason. Actually, I heard an American officer say that it's going to take another 40 years. Are you prepared for that? Well, I think we're prepared to stay as long as the Afghans want us there to, to support them. I think that's the, that's the bottom line. Um, but for example, the Afghan National Security Forces, um, it's going to cost several billion dollars a year to continue to finance them. Well, Afghanistan, uh, notwithstanding the very uh, good economic growth they've had lately, is not going to be in a position to fund its own security forces for a long time. That's going to require the international community to, to provide that assistance. Same thing with training. Um, 
I don't think there's a, there's a big political problem in providing that kind of assistance, and I think we're committed to do that, along with the development assistance, uh, assistance with governance, and all those other important things, uh, including assistance with human rights. We, we, the, 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 this, this thing about do you support human rights or women's rights or not, it's not a black or white issue. Um, it, the, the fact is that the protection of human rights and, human, and, and women's rights is in the Constitution. And I think it's the Afghan government position that in any negotiation and a political settlement, uh, those insurgents who are interested in, in laying down their arms and engaging in a political process have to agree to support the, the Afghan constitution. Now, obviously, down the road, uh, the Afghans can change their own constitution, just like the constitution can be changed in their own countries. But right now, that is the law of the land in Afghanistan. Um, and so I don't think there's any harm in saying that we support the Afghan constitution. Um, and and I, I take uh, Mrs. Hoff's point that uh, we're not in Afghanistan to defend the, the rights of women. That's not why we sent forces to Afghanistan. Um, but um, that, that is part of the, the rule of law in Afghanistan. Um, certainly there are, going to be, there are going to be problems. There's problems with human rights in all countries, uh, including in the United States. We all have our, our problems. We're all struggling to make improvements. Um, and this is something we'll be engaged with, that, with uh, on Afghanistan for a very, very long time. So uh, now some people ask, why, did you, why do you have this July 2011 uh, deadline? Why did you feel necessary to say that? Because uh, as Mrs. Hoff points out, it gives the impression to a lot of uh, uh, insurgents, oh, we can just wait out the coalition. They're planning to withdraw in July of next year. Well, I, I think, um, as we all know, if you don't have a deadline to get something done, uh, work expands to fill the time available for completion. And I can tell you, when, even when I was in Afghanistan uh, in 2006-2007, the mantra was, we have to be patient. This is going to take a long time to build up uh, the Afghan state and so forth. And when you say that, people say, oh, it's going to take a long time. Well, I guess I don't have to work so hard. This is not so urgent. I can kind of take it easy. This is, gonna take, this is a marathon. I don't have to work that hard. And, and the fact is that politically, for political reasons within the country and within uh, our own, within the coalition itself, we don't have uh, a long time. We have a short amount of time, especially for the combat mission. And the combat mission is only necessary until the Afghan National Security Forces are in a position to provide for their own, uh, for their own security. So that's why we're really emphasizing the buildup of those forces. Uh, but we're kidding ourselves if we think that we're going to be all done with this mission even after those security forces are stood up because they're going to need financial support support on human rights development and so on. But I have to come back to Mr. Jalalo on that topic. Um, does this deadline, July 2011, uh, do any harm to the mission for people don't trust uh, the international community anymore that they stick to the goals? This gives a tool of uh, propaganda to Taliban, which they uh, try to convince people that we are going to be here for a long time, but the international community is leaving. Uh, however, uh, the, uh, just to be realistic, eventually I think the uh, Afghanistan should be stabilized by Afghanistan itself. By uh, building a capacity to defend itself, to stabilize itself, to provide services to people. It will take time. To be realistic, I don't believe that by uh, October of 2011, Afghanistan National Army and Police will be in a position to conduct I mean, independent operations. And according to the uh, uh, recent uh, report of uh, Special Investigative General uh, uh, for Reconstruction of Afghanistan, General Field, only 25% of Afghan army as the, uh, at the level of uh, capability milestone one, which makes it uh, capable of conducting independent operation. The rest are not. For police, that, that number is 12%. So it will take time. Uh, and I believe that the, uh, during the recent visit of President Karzai in Washington, I, it was assured that the United States will have a long commitment with Afghanistan. 
in the 2001, the, the, the drawdown in 2011, means that at the beginning of the drawdown, as Afghan capacity improves, increases, that drawdown, the pace will be adjusted to that. So therefore, uh, uh, today I think people in Afghanistan have some the flickers of hope that it is not a complete withdrawal and, and uh, cutting uh, uh, what they call it. Uh, it is going to be gradual, adjusted to the, uh, the, uh, the capability of Afghanistan. However, it is, it has created some, some uh, you know, uh, anxiety in Afghanistan and tools of propaganda, not only for Taliban, but for some big, uh, uh, entities in the neighborhood that say, okay, the time will come, maybe we'll hedge our bets by the time when the United States is, is, is gone from Afghanistan. Uh, there was one question uh, left. You might answer. Yeah. Yes, I, will. Um, <clears throat> I think that, of course, we, we cannot withdraw from Afghanistan and uh, leave the country uh, yeah, to, to its own destiny. So we have to create some kind of, let me just call it, uh, peacekeeping forces. I, I'm not thinking about blue helmets. We have made our experience with this. But some kind of light military footprint has to remain there until the Afghan national security forces are able to do the job by themselves. But it should not give the impression of combat forces. And I, I, I think, personally, that it will be much easier to convince our taxpayers to deploy peacekeeping forces than combat forces. This is also, I think, a kind of, of wording, a kind of shaping a new idea for the future of Afghanistan. And I was asked, you asked the question, if we have learned our lessons. Well, I think, yes, we have learned our lessons. And uh, one of the lessons, from my point of view, is we should become more realistic. And we should hope that our taxpayers will give us the chance to show that we have learned our lessons. I think that we cannot make much more mistakes than we have made in the past, because then our taxpayers, they will uh, withdraw their, their support. From, from any country, and I think you have the same problem in, in, in the United States too. So therefore, we have, from my point of view, now one shot, and this must be precise. And if we fail this time, I think it will be very problematic to convince the audiences at home to give the necessary support for, the Af uh, for, for, for Afghanistan so that they can provide peace and stability to, to their own people. For me, when I'm asked, for me it's, it's yeah, just let me say, normally I try to be very rational, but for me it's also a, a moral issue. We have committed ourselves to Afghanistan, and we have, mis have made mistakes, but it's not the Afghan people who finally should pay the price for our mistakes. So we have made a commitment, and we have to fulfill it, but uh, from time to time we should be more realistic, and we should abandon our own wishful thinking and our own dreams, because people in Afghanistan have very different experiences in life, and uh, if we do not succeed to, to focus on, on, the, on the ordinary people in, in, in the rural region, I think we will never have the chance to, to bring a, a stable uh, situation to Afghanistan. So, um, inshallah, I hope that uh, we, we will <laughs> succeed uh, with, with a more realistic approach. Are there yeah, any more questions? I just want to have a comment. Um, I, I agree with everything that's just been said. Uh, and this is an incredibly, this is a period of maximum action required and we have to get it right. I don't think any of us, any of our peoples can afford coming back to a conference like this three or four years from now, saying we've got a new approach. Uh, let me tell you why the, the last three didn't work. Uh, we lose credibility. Uh, we, lo we certainly lose our publics. I agree with Elka 100%. I also think at some point down the road it, it will be much easier uh, my sense in Germany, I'm, I'm, and I'm, I'm certain in the United States, to sell a peacekeeping notion, a lighter, a lighter military footprint. Um, our credibility, I, I want to pat myself on the back on two points here on behalf of the United States of America. Our credibility on keeping our forces in countries that want us to keep them there is very high. Witness Korea this week. So we've been in Korea for about, at this point, 60 years. South Republic of Korea wants us in Korea. We are 
there happily. Uh, we're no longer in Germany because Germany needs us for their, uh, directly for security, but we still have over 50,000 troops in Germany. We cased the colors in Berlin in July of 1994. That certainly was for German uh, uh, security interests. So that is, what, 48 or 49 years. So I don't know whether or not the uh, US officer was right about 40, but the answer that Bill gave is right. We'll be there as long as they need us. Um, the other comment, this is not a, this is not uh, um, thin-skinned about this. I just want to reiterate what Minister Jalali said about why others have gone to Afghanistan and why this uh, alliance has gone to Afghanistan. We do not think of ourselves and never have thought of ourselves as an empire. Uh, we're in Afghanistan uh, because we were attacked and the, the, the attacks were born in that part of the world. We have no empire aspirations and never have. And as, it's a very important, I just want to underscore that distinction. Uh, and uh, as Colin Powell once said, particularly as it related to Europe and Asia in World War II, the only amount of land we ever asked for was the six foot by three foot to bury our guys. There are some more questions in, your, in the audience. So maybe we take two this time. Thank you. Uh, I don't know where to begin. Uh, maybe one <laughs> lady and one man. Let's take maybe here. I have a question for you, sir. Mr. Jowley. Yes. Uh, since the Constitution, the new Constitution was written, it says Islamic Republic of Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. What does that mean? It means that you have only to be Muslim or we can worship or what about women? The whole concept of the new constitution. Could you please answer me? One other. Okay, one question maybe from this side. Maybe a man this time? There are actually many women. Okay, let's give it actually to the women. I'll leave, uh, maybe we'll start here. Hi, my name is Mabel Malaba. I'm a student in National College of Ireland in Dublin. Um, I'm pleased actually to hear that you are so much concerned about uh, Afghanistan. And I'm sorry, very sorry about the 9-11, um, the bombing in uh, America. And I hope you get to a resolution, resolution to who actually did that. Um, talking of the Afghan people, I'm actually worried about the 40-year issue that uh, you'll be staying um, in Afghanistan, still with the military for 40 years of in Afghanistan. I'm also worried about uh, the people who, who is going to be paying for the military in Afghanistan. Is it the people, the taxpayers, or who? That's what I want to know. Secondly, um, you must not only consider Afghanistan, look in other countries. There's lots of uh, people who are having problems. The reason being, um, I'm originally oh, from- I'm sorry, okay. so you're kind of running out of time. Okay, okay. just two take seconds, the first question? Two seconds. Okay, I'm originally from Zimbabwe. You should also consider the people uh, of um, Zimbabwe, especially the land reform issue. Um, where do they go? Who will look after them? Thank okay, you. the first question for Mr. Jalali. Okay, uh, the reason they, it is called Islamic Republic because it is an Islamic country. 99.9% .9 of the population of Afghanistan is Islam, but it, Afghanistan has been an Islamic country for centuries. But it was a moderate, tolerant Islamic country. Uh, before actually some people thought that they can uh, uh, you know, introduce Islam to them, the real Islam. They don't want that because they are Muslim, better Muslim than, than they think uh, in, in, the, in the world. The, uh, in the Constitution, it, it also says that no law in the country can be uh, in contradiction to Islamic tenets, principles. Islamic principles, the way it is interpreted is different in this country. In Afghanistan, the, the Sharia law and civil law coexisted peacefully for centuries in Afghanistan. This is not something new. In 1970s, I went to settle dispute between tribes in the, in the south in Paktia province. And I used all mechanisms. 
I'll use civil uh, code, I use Sharia, I use the Jargas uh, tradition, and there was all uh, complementing each other. It is the, 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 the imported kind of interpretation in Afghanistan. That's why people in Afghanistan stood up against the Taliban. It, 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 they didn't want that kind of interpretation that they brought them, and they would never accept that. That's why I'm telling you responsible, that responsibly that Taliban are not going to come back to turn the clock back to the world. Thank you. Bill Miller is going to be so kind to answer the question, the lady. <coughs> The, the question on who, who pays, um, the, uh, the, the goal, of course, is to stand up the Afghan National Security Forces. But as I said, even after the Afghan National Security Forces are stood up, they're going to still need a lot of support. I completely agree with Minister Jalali. I think it's going to be, even after the Afghan National Security Forces are fully really trained and equipped and everything, it's going to be a while before they're, they're going to be able to do fully independent operations and so forth. They'll need support. Um, but that support will be a lot different than what we have now. What we have now in Afghanistan is combat forces. Hopefully, beginning next year and, and going on for however long it takes, we'll be, we'll be able to gradually draw down our combat forces so that the forces we have there, uh, that, that we're leaving there, are more trainers and supporters, those kinds of forces. Um, the big price tag, and, and those forces will obviously cost some money, but the, the also the big price tag will be the Afghan National Army itself. It costs several billion dollars a year to maintain both the Afghan National Army and the Afghan National Police at the levels that we're talking about building them up to. I mean, we're talking about 300,000 uh, uh, soldiers and policemen in the field. So, uh, and, but the, the, the price tag right now that the U.S. pays to support our deployment in Afghanistan is around $100 billion a year. So to be honest to you, uh, for the American taxpayer, if you say, uh, we're working toward a solution where uh, you're, instead of $100 billion a year, it's going to be 7 or $8 billion a year, I think most Americans will find that's a good deal. Um, that's still a lot of money, obviously, but it's, it's something that I think is sustainable. But it's also a commitment that we're, gonna, that we're obviously going to, uh, as an international community, uh, we're going to have to be prepared to make. Well, since we heard earlier, it's all about time, uh, not just in Afghanistan, it's uh, a problem here as well. Uh, I have one last question for all of you. Um, could you complete the sentence, in 10 years in Afghanistan will be? In 10 years, Afghanistan will be? In 10 years, Afghanistan will be in a much better condition than it is actually today. <laughs> You've got your own <laughs> Well, I think it is. Uh, uh, the Afghanistan National Development Strategy says that by 2020, Afghanistan will be a, a, a secure country, stabilized country, living at peace with itself and with its neighbors. However, provided all the promises and pledges the international community made uh, and the uh, neighbors cooperate, that goal will be achieved. Bill? Afghanistan in 10 years will be one of the top spots for uh, German tourists uh, to go to. That's a great perspective to, uh, yes, that's a great perspective to finish this panel. Uh, thank you very much to Elkehoff, Ali Jalali, and Bill Mella.